In this video we look at the FP1 work on sums of series. The syllabus requires us to be familiar with a series of formulae. It, it requires us to be familiar with the method of mathematical induction and the method of differences. The key facts, well we need to be familiar with sigma notation and its three or four basic properties. We also need to be familiar with three standard summation results. The first one for the sum of the positive integers between 1 and n. And that one you can regard as being the sum of an arithmetic progression, but it's a result that one way or the other you must know it's not given in the formula booklet. The other two results for the sum of the squares of the positive integers, integers between 1 and n and the sum of the cubes of the positive integers between 1 and n are given in the formula booklet. We do need to be able to produce a proof by induction and we do need to know how to express a fraction as a sum of two partial fractions. For our first example we look at the January 2012 paper. We are being asked to pr prove the sum of a series using mathematical induction. Now when we're dealing with the sum of series expressed within sigma notation it can often be a good idea just to remove the sigma notation so to remove the sigma notation shorthand. So what we're trying to prove is that 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3 plus 3 times 4 all the way along to n times n plus 1 is equal to n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 3. For a proof by induction, we must start by showing that the result is true for n equals 1. So when n equals 1, the left hand side is simply 1 times 2. There aren't any other terms, and we know that 1 times 2, of course, is 2. When n equals 1, the right hand side is 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 2 all over 3. In other words, it's 1 times 2 times 3 over 3, which is just equal to 2. So the left-hand side of our result is equal to the right-hand side of our result when n equals 1. So we know the result is true for n equals 1. The second step for proof by induction is that we assume the result is true for n equals k and we must deduce that it is also true for n equals k plus 1. In other words, for this problem, we are assuming that 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3 all the way along to k times k plus 1 is the same thing as k times k plus 1 times k plus 2, all divided by 3. And we need to deduce that 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3 plus all the way along to k times k plus 1 together with the k plus 1th term, which is k plus 1 times k plus 2, equals the right-hand side with n replaced by k plus 1. So the right-hand side is going to be k plus 1 times by k plus 1 plus 1 times by k plus 1 plus 2, all over 3. And of course that simply the same thing as k plus 1 times k plus 2 times k plus 3 over 3. So at this point here we know what we've got to try and do for step 2. We need to show that 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3 plus k times k plus 1 plus k plus 1 times k plus 2 is the same thing as k plus 1 times k plus 2 times k plus 3 over 3. So that there is what I am targeting as I work through step two. So we're assuming that and we have got to start thinking about this and remember we're trying to show that the left hand side 
comes out to be equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2 times k plus 3 all over 3. Right, we're assuming we know the result is true for n equals k. So the terms here is the sum of the first k terms. And we are assuming here that the sum of the first k terms is precisely k times k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 3. So, making use of the assumption, we can say that the sum of the first k plus 1 terms is equal to the sum of the first k terms, which is k, k plus 1, k plus 2 over 3, plus the final term. Now, if we look at this right-hand side here, we can see that we have got a common factor. We've certainly got a common factor of k plus 1. We've certainly got a common factor of k plus 2. And it's well worth our while taking out the common factor of a third as well, so that we've got that third outside any subsequent brackets. So there we are, we've taken out a common factor of a third, we've taken out a common factor of k plus 1, we've taken out a fa common factor of k plus 2. So, what have we now got? For the first term here, We've already got the third, we've already got the k plus 1, we've already got the k plus 2, so all we need to put into the bracket for the first term is a k. For the second term here, we've got k plus 1, k plus 2. When we've done the factorization, we've got k plus 1, k plus 2, but we've taken a third out. So if when we multiply the brackets out we want to get 1k plus 1k plus 2, we're going to need a third times 3, gives me the 1, times the k plus 1k plus 2. So, we've got what we were aiming for. We've got that if the result is true for n equals k, then the sum of the first k plus 1 terms is k plus 1, k plus 2, k plus 3, all divided by 3, which is what we were aiming for. So we can now say that if the result is true for n equals k, then it will also be true for n equals k plus 1. So, we've now shown that the result is true for n equals 1, and we've also shown that the result is true if the result is true for n equals k, then it is also true for n equals k plus 1. We know the result is true for n equals 1. That's the first thing we did. The second step now enables us to deduce the result must also be true for n equals 1 plus 1. In other words, n equals 2. The second step now, we know the result is true for n equals 2, so the result must be also be true for n equals 2 plus 1. In other words, for n equals 3. And we can keep on going along that process of repeating step 2 until we've gone through all of the integers. So the result is therefore true for all positive integers n. The six marks for this question. The first mark is simply for verifying the result is true for n equals 1. There are then four marks for the central part of the inductions process, which is showing that if the result is true for n equals k, then it is also true for n equals k plus 1. And then there is a final mark for just tying up the ends and making it clear that what you have done is sufficient to prove that the result is true for all positive integers n. We now move to looking at a question from the 2012 paper. We have to show that if Sn is the sum between 1 and n of r times r squared minus 1, then Sn can be expressed as a product of linear factors. So we have Sn is the sum between 1 and n of r times r squared minus 1. Multiplying the brackets out, r times r squared minus 1 is simply r cubed minus r. 
So we have the sum between 1 and n of r cubed minus r. Now one of the important properties of sigma notation is that if we have the sigma summation of either a sum or difference, we can write that as being the sum or difference of two summations. So we can just split that up as the sum between 1 and n of r cubed, take away the sum between 1 and n of r. Now these are two of the standard results that we mentioned earlier on. The first one, the sum of the cubes of the integers between 1 and n, is a quarter n squared n plus 1 squared, and that one appears in your formula booklet. The second one, the sum of the integers between 1 and n is a half n n plus 1, is the one that you need to know. Now looking at these two expressions, we can see that at these two terms on the right hand side, we can see that we've certainly got a common factor of n, we've certainly got a common factor of n plus 1, and it is probably worth our while taking out a common factor of a quarter as well. So if we take out a common factor of a quarter, n, n plus 1, then to get the first term, we would need to multiply that common factor by n, n plus 1. And to get the second term, we would simply need to multiply that common factor by 2. So we have a quarter, n plus 1, n, n plus 1, times by n, n plus 1, take away 2. Tidying up the bracket here, we have a quarter n n plus 1, n squared plus n minus 2, and n squared plus n minus 2 can be written as n plus 2 times n minus 1. So we now have Sn as a product of linear factors, as requested. Marking for this question, we have one mark for splitting the summation into its two parts, two marks there for making use of the standard results, and then two marks finally for moving through from those two terms there through to the final answer of a product of linear factors. Our final example for this video comes from the 2010 paper and the first part of the question says we have to express 1 over r times r plus 2 in partial fractions and then we have to use that result to show that the sum between 1 and n of 1 over r, r plus 2 is equal to 3 quarters minus 2n plus 3 over 2 lots of n plus 1 n plus 2. So for the partial fractions first of all, if we wish to express 1 over r, r plus 2 as partial fractions, we are going to need to say 1 over r, r plus 2 is a over r plus b over r plus 2. Several different ways that you can find out what a and b are. The one I tend to use is I just multiply up by r times r plus 2, which gives me 1 equals a times r plus 2 plus br. So if I put r equals 0, we obtain 1 equals 2a. In other words, a must equal a half. And if we put r equals minus 2, then the left-hand side is 1, must equal minus 2b, and that gives me b is minus a half. So my partial fraction form for 1 over r, r plus 2, is a half over r, take away a half over r plus 2, or equivalently, it's 1 half of 1 over r, take away 1 over r plus 2. So, we know that 1 over r, r plus 2, is the same thing as 
1 half of 1 over r take away 1 over r plus 2. Now we need, at this stage need to use two of our properties of summation again. The first one is that if I have the summation of a constant times a term going through, I can say that's the same thing as the constant times the summation of the terms. So in other words, I can just pull the half out of the summation. So we can say that we've got one half of the summation between 1 and n of 1 over r take away 1 over r plus 2. Now, as we saw in the previous example, if we have the summation of a difference, we can rewrite that as the difference of two summations. So we can say that a half of the summation between 1 and n of 1 over r take away 1 over r plus 2 is the same same as one half times the summation between one and n of one over r, take away one half of the summation between r equals one and n of one over r plus two. Writing these out longhand, we have one half times one over one plus one over two plus one over three all the way up to one over n take away one half of one over three plus one over four all the way along to one over n plus one over n plus one plus one over n plus two at the far end. And if we look carefully here we can see that a large number of the terms simply cancel each other out. So the third on the first bracket will cancel out with the third on the second bracket. The quarter on the first bracket will cancel out with the quarter on the second bracket. And all the way along, the 1 over n on the first bracket will cancel out with the 1 over n in the second bracket. So, to that extent, the series has really sort of telescoped down to just giving us two terms on the first bracket, and then we've got two terms left on the second bracket. So we've got 1 half of 1 plus a half take away one half of one over n plus one plus one over n plus two. Now the first term, a half times one plus a half is simply three quarters. So we've got three quarters take away a half of one over n plus one plus one over n plus two. Now to add those two fractions we need to use a common denominator which will obviously be n plus one n plus two. So, if we just tidy up the top of that fraction, we've got n plus 2 plus n plus 1 is 2n plus 3. So, we've got 3 quarters, take away 2n plus 3 on the top of our fraction, and 2 times n plus 1, n plus 2 on the bottom of the fraction, which is precisely the expression we were trying to um, obtain. Marking on this question, well there was a method mark and two answer marks for obtaining the partial fractions. For knocking out the terms, so for this part of the question here, there were two marks. And then obtaining the expression here was another mark and following it through to obtain the given answer was the final mark. And that completes the video looking at sums of series.